next speaker, plenary speaker, is Ninke Decker. Ninke is a professor of biological physics at Delft University in the Netherlands, and she has been active in uh, studying DNA replication, RNA replication, interaction of proteins, and DNA and RNA. And she's been using very innovative methods of single molecule uh, manipulation, including magnetic tweezers, optical tweezers, and single molecule fluorescence to study uh, uh, these processes and the interaction of DNA and RNA with proteins. So today, she's going to tell us about adventures in DNA in chromatin replication using single molecule biophysics. Ninke. Better? Better. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, uh, indeed, uh, so thanks, Carlos, for the nice introduction. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the work in my lab on, uh, on replication. Uh, so first I want to, uh, where's the theme, let's find the pointer, uh, and I just want to acknowledge, of course, the people who did uh, all the work, uh, who are depicted uh, primarily on the top row, uh, where John Diffley at the Crick Institute is our, uh, our collaborator, uh, and I'm, if I have time, I'll also show some data uh, from the, the two guys uh, below here uh, towards the end. Uh, Okay, uh, so this is what I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to start with an introduction and then uh, give you uh, a few studies that we've done on DNA and chromatin replication. I'm going to talk about some of the proteins that are involved uh, in loading the DNAP with helicase, which is called MCN or MCN27. Um, and then, very briefly, uh, due to uh, constraint on time, and what images in the context of content, and then I'm going to say a few things about the CMG. The DNA replication. Uh, so obviously, right? Uh, in order, to, in order for an organism to grow and maintain itself, uh, cells need to divide, and in doing so, they have to copy their DNA. Uh, and that, uh, right? Uh, the DNA itself is compacted uh, into chromosomes, as all of you know. And then the double helical structure provides uh, an obvious way uh, to get two copies. Um, of daughter DNA starting from one parental copy of DNA. Um, so this I think most of you will know, um, but it's always fun to look at some of the numbers. Uh, okay, so we have a lot of DNA, right? Three billion base pairs, but we also have a lot of cells, right? So we have order 10 to the 14 cells in our body. Uh, and then these cells on average, right? Depends a bit on the cell type, of course, but during a typical human lifespan, they might divide order 100 times. Uh, then we have, right, approximately one DNA, one meter of DNA per cell, which is, right, all curled up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that, that is the total length, uh, if you were to stretch it out. Uh, and so if you take the product of these numbers, you realize that over the course of a, a typical lifespan, we synthesize a light year's worth of DNA, uh, which is, I find amazing from this sort of nanoscale, right, context in which we start to really spans the, uh, to the astronomical scale. This is all carried out by this... Uh, uh, machinery, uh, which is called the replosome, right, because it replicates DNA, and there's various elements, uh, uh, the protein elements that are part of it that I'll describe in more detail later. So then, uh, right, normally this proceeds, uh, you know, without any errors, but, uh, but not always, right? So here's again the, the DNA, which is being copied here, let's say, by the replosome, but then there can be certain issues, right? So you could have protein blocks on the DNA, uh, or additional kind of secondary structures forming with RNA that, that normally wouldn't be there, right? You can get uh, other secondary uh, structure features just in the DNA itself. You can have gaps and lesions and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, the replosome has to deal with all of these obstacles and sometimes it, it doesn't work out properly, right? So you can have uh, mutations in genes uh, or you can get the replosome to halt or stall or get, you know, the part that unwinds the DNA to decouple from the part that synthesizes DNA. And that leads, for instance, to expose single-stranded DNA or DNA breaks and all kinds of problems. Uh, so in the end, that means that this, this process of copying has to be studied at many different levels. We focus really on the molecular level, um, but also the cellular, genomic, and organismal levels are important. Uh, um, so, uh, because in the end, right, it, it, the, the consequences transmit to all these different um, levels and it also means that it's an exploitable therapeutic target. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, the molecular level, uh, and I'm going to start by showing you how the eukaryotic replosome is built up, right? It's different than, than pro in prokaryotes, uh, and over many decades, biochemists have been able to arrive at the following picture. So in yeast, there's a um, specific uh, preferred sequence to which the origin recognition complex, shown here in red, will bind. And in this loading phase of DNA replication, the goal is to load the inactive form of the helicase, which is called MCM or MCM27. And each MCM consists of a single hexamer. But the final product that needs to be achieved is this double hexamer of MCM. So once that's been achieved, uh, then it needs to be phosphorylated and together with approximately 10 other proteins, uh, you can end up forming uh, the active form of the helicase, which is now called CMG, uh, where the M in CMG still stands for MCM. Uh, so once this is formed, uh, then it's possible, it can, it, it start, it's initially formed on double-stranded DNA, but it can tra transition to single-stranded DNA, and then the, the parental DNA can essentially be unwound. And if you that, then add the polymerases, which are the ones that build in new nucleotides, then ultimately you can replicate the DNA. Okay, so this is sort of the schematic that has been arrived at, at, at over, over many years. Uh, and now that this sort of baseline is, is well established, you can think about doing single molecule techniques, uh, um, right, that will allow you to look at this process, this complex process that has to happen uh, as, as faultlessly as possible, uh, right? You can think, of, think about how, to, how you would use biophysics to probe some questions. So, right, how does the, the CMG really function as a molecular machine? or what happens to these other protein factors that, that are important to establish the CMG once it's been formed. Uh, how do the polymerases coordinate all their activities? How do they change when there's lesions or, or obstacles, et cetera, on the DNA? Uh, how do, what happens when, you've, uh, when one replosome essentially encounters another, which will certainly happen on our linear DNA, uh, because you have many places where things can start, and then um, I haven't said it, well, I alluded to it, right? Our the DNA in, in, our, in the nucleus, nucleus is very much compacted uh, into chromatin, so really what has to happen is not DNA replication, but chromatin replication. And here I just have a, a little cartoon of a, a chromosome with different starting points where an, an origin recognition complex shown in yellow can load. This is in practice how it happens uh, in our cells. Uh, and for instance, it's known that you know, how these origins of replication, as they're called, are, are fired and what the timing thereof is, is very different uh, um, in, transcriptional, in transcriptionally active uh, parts of the DNA compared to transcriptionally uh, non-active uh, parts of the DNA, and this has to also do with the openness of the DNA. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, so that is relevant, uh, right, in the context of chromatin replication, but also in the sort of carrying out the entire process of DNA replication. So those are the kinds of uh, um, questions that you could try to answer, also with single molecule techniques. And for us, the first challenge was really to think about what would be the right single molecule approach. And I think in the end, the answer is that there's multiple, but this is sort of the little journey that we went through. So as Carlos mentioned earlier uh, this morning, uh, my lab has over many years worked on magnetic tweezers, so this is kind of where we started. Right here, you just have a DNA anchored to a surface, and surface into a bead, and you monitor the height of the bead above the surface. Uh, and we thought, oh, if we assemble the CMG helicase on this, and this DNA is torsionally constrained, then we should be able to get a plectinemic supercoil uh, coil in the DNA to form, which is readily detected, and that way we can read out right, the activity of the helicase. Uh, it has the advantage of being very high throughput, uh, you can apply force and torque, and right, in, in principle, you can detect protein motion uh, by looking at the changes in the height of the magnetic bead. Well, it didn't work at all because we have, like I said, we need maybe 15 different proteins to assemble, uh, for instance, the helicase, and we, at the time we weren't doing any fluorescence readouts and we just didn't have enough information to sort of debug this system. So then we said, okay, we have to do fluorescence. There's, many, there's different approaches, right? Here I showed two turf approaches where the difference between them is the way you tether the DNA, right? You can take long DNAs and tether them on both, both sides as shown on the left, or you can take short DNAs and, and do co-localization spectroscopy. Um, we're currently in, in the lab still doing both. We started with this one, adding all the proteins to the flow cell. Uh, it has the advantage of being high throughput. You can now monitor protein, protein identity through fluorescence detection, and you can also see the motion. 
Well, what, what we discovered in this is that adding all the proteins to in tethered molecules on the flow cell like this was, was not a great success. Uh, so then this also really didn't work. And presumably it was because of the um, proximity uh, of, the, of the surface, right, which led to always you know, some A-specific binding and then protein-protein interactions and essentially a replosome that may have been functional but was frequently halted. And so right now we're using this approach primarily, uh, right? So optical tweezers, so we go back uh, uh, to, uh, to this morning's talk as well. Because uh, it's, you know, it's obviously you can tether a DNA between two optical traps. Uh, um, as as Carlos's, Carlos's lab is, has pioneered um, uh, many decades ago. And then uh, what's been added here is a confocal scanning laser, uh, right, which scans the DNA and allows you to see what proteins are there. Uh, and this has been commercialized, and at present we use the commercial version of this instrument. Uh, so I was initially very skeptical of this because it, it's a low throughput technique again, right? You do one molecule at a time. Uh, okay, you can apply a force and you can obviously see protein detection and protein identity but it really is one molecule at a time, which for us kind of felt like a step back. But the advantage is that you're far away from the surface, uh, so we tried it nonetheless. Uh, okay, for to study DNA replication, you, as I mentioned, you also need a lot of proteins, so currently we also purify most of these proteins ourselves in the lab, and uh, well, that's, uh, that's part, of the, part of the work that goes with it. Um, so let me now tell you just a, a few stories about what we've learned about some of these proteins. And, so we started out with the first phase, right, uh, where you have this or origin uh, recognition complex, and the goal is, as I mentioned, uh, to create this MCM double hexamer. Uh, there's an intermediate where ORC and MCM, uh, where ORC essentially recruits the first MCM, uh, and the puzzle in the field is still a little bit how you get essentially from here to there. Okay, uh, so what we're doing here is we're, uh, we have fluorescently labeled ORC, and we essentially uh, dip it, or we, we, we move our DNA molecule into this channel with fluorescently labeled ORC, and then we move it away again in, in order to, and do this confocal scanning to see what's there. And our first uh, concern was to make sure that in this biophysics setup we were seeing same, the same types of things that biochemists had observed uh, separately. Uh, so here, the way you should see this is that this is the bead, which will have other DNAs and therefore other proteins, or also org proteins bound to it, here in green. This is the other bead, right, and the DNA is stretched in between them, and here's an ORC molecule bound, and here's another one. Uh, so it's known from biochemical experiments that ORC is not stable to high salt wash, uh, and that we just confirm. Uh, so then, right, you can repeat on many different molecules and get an idea of where does ORC bind. Uh, so again, right, we typically in these experiments worked with a 20 kV DNA with an origin of replication at roughly one-third of its length. Um, you don't control the orientation of the DNA in the optical trap, right? So you can have uh, visually, right, the org bound to the left or to the right. So uh, in the end, we make plots uh, relative to the DNA center. And that's shown over here, right? So this is probability, and this is distance from the DNA center. And the double dashed line here is the origin of replication. And you can see that ORC preferentially binds there, although it's, it can certainly also bind elsewhere on the DNA. Uh, so we can also confirm some other things that are known from, from biochemical experiments. Here we're looking at the, we can essentially vary the force during the incubation period. And it's known that ORC, when, when it binds, it will bend the DNA a little bit. This is known from structural uh, biology. And we can see, indeed, that as we increase the force, essentially the number of, of DNAs in which we see ORC foci goes down. So this is consistent with that biochemical uh, observation. So then, uh, but the main reason, of course, to do these single molecule experiments is to really be able to, be able to look at the, the protein dynamics of the individual molecules. So that was our, our focus. So here we plot the entire length of the DNA molecule as a function of time. You can see the two uh, origins here. And these are the ORC molecules followed over time that initially bind to an origin region. And you can see that by and large they stay where they are. Uh, sometimes one escapes the origin and then moves away. Uh, this is all the data that we collected where ORC molecules were initially found elsewhere, uh, uh, away from the origin, and you can see that by and large these molecules are more mobile. And uh, here you see a movie of, uh, of this behavior of ORC scan essentially scanning back and forth along the DNA. Uh, and in general, right, you see four kinds of effects. Either ORC is initially found at the origin and stays there, that's case one, or it's found somewhere else and it moves along the DNA, case two, 
case three, it's found at the origin, can move away. In case four, it's initially bound somewhere else, moves along the DNA, finds the origin, and stays. Uh, um, so that, uh, right, as biophysicists, we, don't, we, we like to quantify things a little bit more, right? Just traces is not always so convincing. Uh, so we converted, per trace, we made a we calculated diffusion constant. Uh, uh, so you can see this is for all of the data, right? So what you can essentially see is a bimodal distribution with a fast population and a slow population. Uh, what's, what's fast and what's slow? Well, if we take DCAS9, which is a protein uh, that you can get to bind to specific sequence uh, on DNA and definitely will not move, then we measure this distribution. Right? Obviously, we have some experimental noise, so we're never going to measure no motion. Uh, so this is essentially static. Um, and then if we uh, take the origin but mutate it so that ORC cannot bind uh, properly, then you see essentially only slow. Oh, sorry, only fast. Uh, uh, right, so this suggests indeed this picture that overall, right, ORC is scanning diffusively along the DNA until it finds the origin sequence and then typically uh, stays there, although of course it, it, it can unbind again. Uh, well, it can unbind always uh, into solution, but it can also continue to uh, or start rescanning the DNA. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, what we did with, um, uh, with ORC. And then we moved on to the next step, right, uh, looking at the uh, formation of uh, MCM. So this we did a little bit differently um, because we are incubating the proteins with the DNA in bulk. The reason that we did it is it takes some time for this MCM27 uh, complex to, uh, to stably form on the DNA. And that was easier to do in bulk than to wait one molecule at a time in the single molecule experiment. Uh, and then uh, we see what's there, right? Uh, again, MCM is, is labeled. And again, this is a plot. Probability essentially is a function of distance from the DNA center. This is a different DNA than before. It's, it's only 10 kb. Um, double dashed line is again the origin region. You can see that it has some preference for the origin, but it's, it's broad. Broadly, you, we find it initially broadly distributed uh, on the DNA in this context. Uh, you can also measure diffusion constants because it's known, uh, this makes sense also from biochemical studies that um, already maybe 15 years ago showed that MCM is a mobile protein and we confirm this, right? This is uh, our data for MCM. And again, as uh, reference, DCAS9. So uh, it's much less diffusive than ORC, it's by order 100 fold difference. Uh, and here we also quantify that whether uh, the mobility as, as a function of the stoichiometry, so whether they were single or double uh, MCM. So, and in this data set, we really couldn't see a difference between the two. Essentially, both were mobile then. So it gives us a measure of the diffusion constant, right, its magnitude. Uh, and it also shows that these single hexamers are, are mobile on the DNA. It was only previously known for the double hexamers that they were mobile then. So then, uh, right, so we see, as I mentioned, they diffuse more slowly than ORC, um, but the single, and the single hexamer is also mobile, and if the goal ultimately is to create a double hexamer, you can imagine that mobile single ones could perhaps find each other and, and in that way form a double hexamer. So this is something that we're still testing, we together with our collaborators, uh, but let me just overall give you the implications of this part of the work, right? So. It's known also from genetics experiments that there's far more MCMs loaded uh, on the DNA typically than you would think would normally be necessary just to carry out DNA replication. Uh, it has, it's thought to, do, to, to have something to do with uh, uh, issues of stability, right? If things go awry on, in, during DNA replication, uh, MCMs can, uh, can help rescue. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the fact that we readily see these MCMs is consistent with that, and furthermore, even the singles are mobile, giving you this, pictures that two, this picture that two properly oriented single hexamers could diffuse towards each other uh, to form a, a double hexamer. And this is something that we're still uh, working on. This, these are some simulations that we were doing. This is essentially double hexamer yield as a function of distance uh, separating the two, and you can see as the distance gets larger. Um, here is actually where they're almost essentially in contact with one another, and then here when, they, when we start the simulation, and then here obviously the distance uh, probably goes down as distance increases, which is what you would expect. We're comparing to biochemical results. Uh, so this is uh, probably very likely to, to occur. Uh, interestingly, at least in the, U, in the lower eukaryotes, there's another mechanism that's known to exist. Um, it's, uh, when it was first discovered by cryo it was uh, uh, a bit of a surprise. 
um, but it's also separately been confirmed. So here's ORC and here's MCM. And so it's, there's this mode possible where the ORC essentially does like a backflip across the, across the MCM and pushes, positions it, itself in such a way that this ORC can load a new MCM in such a way that the two hexamers are perfectly right, aligned and can form a double. Uh, and you know, I, I, so far this has not been established in the higher eukaryotes, but apparently there, there are multiple mechanisms, at least in the lower eukaryotes. So. Okay, so let me show you uh, a slide or two uh, just looking at this uh, in, the, in chromatin, right? This is just my earlier uh, image, right? DNA is all head readily compacted uh, due to the presence of nucleosomes on the DNA. So what we did here is we took an origin of replication uh, and put two nucleosome positioning sequences, uh, one on each side of it uh, and, uh, and loaded nucleosomes uh, onto those sites. Uh, the H2A, which is one of the histone components of a nucleosome, is here labeled in blue. So if we scan right, uh, our DNA, then we see uh, a blue spot. The two nucleosome positioning sequences are so close together that you would expect to see one diffraction limited spot. And well, uh, this has just been published, so uh, feel free to also contact, and also feel free to contact me uh, you know, separately if you have questions. But this is what we have here is the MCM. Uh, spatial distribution uh, in this context, right, with a nucleosome uh, on either side. And uh, what I showed you previously was kind of a kind of a flat spread out distribution, but you can, in the absence of chromatin, but in the presence of chromatin, it becomes quite peaked. Uh, and we can, we can see that the chromatin limits, really, the, the ability of MCM to diffuse across, uh, along the DNA. Let's say if we take spots here and follow them over time, we can essentially see that they don't move. And uh, what we also looked at is the stoichiometry. So are, are these spots single or double hexamers? And they're uh, more frequently double hexamers than we otherwise see. Uh, and possibly it's because in this sort of confined context with the nucleosomes, this kind of backflip mechanism, uh, where it's maybe essentially favoring it, uh, uh, which is why we end up seeing a lot of double hexamers. But that's, uh, that's a bit of a speculation. Okay, so then I just wanted to conclude on this first part. Uh, uh, so we set up this uh, technique so that we could look at the uh, lo loading proteins uh, involved in forming the replosome and we looked at the relationship, relationship of mobility to sequence in the context of ORC and we looked a, a bit at mobility um, versus stoichiometry in the case of MCM. In the end, we didn't see a big difference between single and double hexamers. As I mentioned, we're currently modeling or we have modeled MCM double hexamer formation and are in the process of comparing to biochemical results, but essentially we see the same trends in both. Uh, and then I showed you that the, the presence of nucleosomes limits the mobility of MCM uh, 27 on DNA and you would think, oh, well, maybe this is a problem, right? If, if you say they have to diffuse uh, towards each other uh, as, a, as a pathway uh, for double hexamer formation, uh, isn't this a problem? Well, it's known that on DNA there are certainly nucleosome-free re regions, and so this diffusion that would lead to double hexamer formation can still uh, take place there. And as I said, there's also, in, at least in the eukaryotes, the lower eukaryotes, there's this backflip mechanism uh, that's also a, an it's alternative that can certainly uh, stay, take place within the uh, chromatin context and may even be favored therein. Okay, so that uh, is what I wanted to say about essentially only the first part of DNA replication. So uh, fortunately, we have been able to advance a little bit beyond this. Uh, uh, so I'll say a few things about the CMG uh, helicase. Uh, so right, so now we're looking more at these two phases in these, uh, in these blue box. I'm going to say almost nothing about how we actually uh, make it work, uh, but feel free to, uh, to contact me uh, separately. And this has also been published uh, recently, recently this year. Um, so here we're looking at CDC45, which is the C in CMG, uh, also in green here. Uh, and so we can look at, OK, how many spots do we have on a DNA? It's typically one. Uh, how many CMGs are there per spot? also well, largely one, and then the total number of CMGs per DNA. You would really expect it to be two or four or six, right, because you get two per origin of replication. Uh, I think the fact that we see a little bit lower 
has to do with experimental handling and things, uh, and things related to that. Um, right? If you have any NIC on your DNA, what we're looking here is we activate it in bulk, in fact, and then we look in the single molecule context, so it may have started to move before we could even see it, and if there's any NIC on the DNA, then you'll lose it. So this is the kind of data that we get, right? So you can see, let me just go back so you can see it again. You see two spots moving away from each other, right? So you would expect uh, two CMGs to start from an origin of replication and move away from each other. Here we caught it right after it had already started. And we also have this movie where we, could, we caught it earlier on, essentially. You can see the two uh, helicases moving away from each other. Um, so then uh, we could quantify again the motion, right, as we like to do in these single molecule studies. DCAS9 is again our, our control for static. Uh, these are the traces that we collected, CMG in the presence of ATP. And uh, right, some of the ones I was just showing you are also part of this data set. Uh, and then right, once you can do that, you can look at velocities, uh, instantaneous or mean. Uh, and, and these are, are rates that make sense compared to biochemical experiments. So. So what surprised us a little bit was that even if we didn't add ATP, uh, we could see motion. We were expecting that nothing would move, but that was, turned out to be incorrect. This is CMD uh, in the absence of ATP. Um, and as you can kind of see from this movie, it's, it becomes, it looks kind of like ORC did, right? It's, uh, again, looks like it's diffusive motion. Uh, so this is what I showed you before with ATP. And then these are the traces that we collected uh, without ATP. Um, and if you take the mobile ones uh, and perform various kinds of analysis, you can convince yourself that this is diffusive motion. And ATP gamma S, you would really expect everything to be static, unfortunately, it was, uh, uh, right? Because it's not hydrolyzable, so you wouldn't expect uh, much to happen. And it's known that nucleotide binding itself uh, should allow CMG to, to form strong contacts with the DNA. So you would expect uh, nucleotide binding to, to result in uh, static motion. Okay, so that gives us sort of, this diff the, the, sort of these different states, right, of the CMG molecular motor. So without nucleotide, one, if it's still on double-stranded DNA, uh, it's uh, diffusive uh, with, with the nucleotide bound, but not hydrolyzed, it then can be static, right? So nucleotide binding will essentially stabilize it on the DNA. I haven't said much about the transition between to, of CMG being bound to double-stranded DNA to being bound to single-stranded DNA. Um, but if it's on single-stranded DNA and you have no nucleotide or no hydrolysis, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's expected to be static, and that's consistent with all of our data. And then finally, if in this context you add, uh, you allow for nucleotide hydrolysis, then you get unidirectional motion, which is also what we see. Uh, and this is really the molecular motor, right, in its, in its kind of canonical state where it's supposed to do its job of DNA unwinding at the front of the replosome. Okay, so that uh, brings me to my second and final set of conclusions. Uh, so I, I only alluded to it, but our, our assay is kind of hybrid. We, we activate in bulk and then observe in the single molecule context, and we can relate uh, right, the motion of CMG essentially to the nucleotide state. Uh, in the absence of ATP, it diffuses. Uh, when ATP binds, uh, it becomes static, um, and, uh, and then... It, and it can translocate uh, unidirectionally in the presence of, of ATP. Uh, and I haven't strictly proven to you that it's unwinding in this data set, um, but we have some, some recent evidence uh, where you have single-stranded binding protein, um, right, that should be visible in that context, uh, and it is, uh, so that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, and our goal ultimately is to establish at the single molecule level uh, the entire eukaryotic, eukaryotic replosome on chromatin, and that's uh, an effort uh, that we're all uh, busy with. And let's see, where's my chair, Carlos? If I have, do I have one more minute, or have I gone a little bit over? I'm on time. All right. So then, one one thing, right? As single molecule experimentalists, uh, right? I, I mentioned that well, one of the reasons we made the magnetic tweezers high throughput was that it made obviously the the life of the PhD students and, and postdocs much much simpler, right? You get more data. Um, so uh, yeah, so here we're doing these things one by one, right? And we have to do a lot of biochemistry before we can even right, start doing the single molecule experiment. So the efficiency is generally low. Uh, so an issue is how to increase it, uh, right? So the first option is that 
It turns out, I, right, what I showed you is this kind of origin-based pathway for the um, formation of the CMG active uh, helicase. But you can play a trick. You can essentially overexpress the protein components of, of C, M, and G in the cell and pull out the entire complex. Uh, uh, so, well, after some, some, war, some issues, because we're not really a biochemistry lab, we're also able to do this ourselves. Uh, to purify this complex, and then it can load onto this uh, single strand, three prime single strand uh, flap, essentially, and start unwinding. Uh, um, and so, uh, and this has been uh, pioneered uh, at the single molecule level by Antoine van Ooyen's group, uh, and we can now also do this, right? So this is this preformed CMG uh, unwinding, or at least in this case, moving on the DNA. Uh, and th here, the same kind of thing, but now in the presence of one of the polymerases, pol epsilon. Uh, so you can see that you have both green and red spots co-translocating as they, as they should. Uh, so this avoids a, a morning of biochemistry, if you will, before you start your single molecule experiment, which is uh, obviously nice. Uh, uh, and then the other option is, in the end, you know, we did a lot of things, that even in this optical tweezer context, we ended up doing a lot of things in bulk, because we found that, you know, even if we were away from the surface, adding a lot of protein to a DNA that's confined uh, on its edges, right, simply due to the presence of the beads, causes crowding on the DNA and doesn't, right, makes, it makes washing steps harder and everything. So it's still hard to do a single molecule experiment like that. So then we thought, well, if we're going to be doing all these things in, in bulk and only subsequently looking at the single molecule level, then we could just go back to turf experiments where we get our throughput back again. Uh, so one of my PhD students, Daniel Ramirez Montero, is working on this, right? He does exactly what we did in the CMG experiments, um, right, doing things in bulk, but then he puts the CMG with the DNA back into a turf setup where you have your throughput back, and this is, CM this is right, the length of the DNA is like this as a function of time. Here we have CMG in the absence of ATP, so it should be diffusing again, and that's uh, uh, what we have over here. So maybe in the end, our, our excursion to optical tweezers <coughs> was... Uh, uh, well, I don't think it was a temporary one because I think in the context of chromatin, staying away from a surface is always useful, uh, but for some DNA replication experiments, uh, returning to this, D uh, this turf microscopy mode uh, will, uh, will make our lives easier. And with that, I just want to thank again uh, the various people in my lab and uh, John Diffley as our collaborator, and you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nike, for a beautiful talk. Um, I'm going to have a question I want to ask first. OK. Um, so I was surprised about seeing the epsilon polymerase mm -hmm. tracking so uh, closely the CMG. And so it is the ray limiting is the CMG motion mm. across the polymerase, or is the polymerase pushing the? Ah. I don't know the answer to that question, and I, so it's still an open question. So in this experiment, um, so what I would say is we have not proven yet that the epsilon is actually synthesizing DNA in this context. It's known that epsilon is, uh, like we haven't, we've tried to probe for DNA synthesis, but we haven't really seen it yet. And it's known that epsilon uh, can, can bind to the CMG by, the, by itself. By uh, uh, in fact, that sometimes, well, anyway, that we can take, uh, we can discuss separately, but they could just move together through their bind, because of their binding interactions. And, and, and so then, right, it would be the rate of CMG motion sure, that would sure. govern everything, right? Uh, and if epsilon has to be performing synthesis, well, then, so it, may be, then maybe it would be rate limiting, but right. we haven't been able to, been able to show that But in that, that experiment, you added nucleotides? I think we did. I think we did, but we, but we have probed for double-stranded DNA there, and we haven't seen that yet. So, uh -huh. okay. right, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Beautiful work, thank you. Um, a question um, on your last point about uh, throughput and, yeah. and turf. So, uh, first question is, um, how do the results that you get so far from turf compare to what you get from the, uh, from, from the Lumix instruments? Yeah. And second is, did you have to passivate surfaces differently in order yeah. to... 
um, make this possible. Okay, so maybe I'll start with the second question. So we do do the, so we do have, we have PEG, right? So on the surface, that's no different than what most people do, right? But what we have here is that, um, so these beads on which we, right, form the DNA complex because that allows us to do some washing steps, etc. cetera, um, they are, um, coated with streptavidin, so we, had to, uh, we have to obviously add biotin, right, in order to elute the DNA from the DNA protein complex. But then you're going to have some biotin end up in your turf setup, so that then makes it difficult to, uh, to get the binding done there, done mm -hmm. properly. So we have dig, anti -di or we have dig on, the, um, on the DNA ends, to, and so that's why we have uh, right, some, some sandwich structure, right, in order to allow, to allow for the binding uh, of the oxygenated DNA ends to the pegylated surface. So that's the only thing that's really different. And then as to whether uh, the results that we have in the turf are the same uh, as in the, um, uh, in the confocal optical trapping system, I can't say that to you, even though I wish I, I could already. And the reason for that is that um, in these experiments, you have to be very careful that all your protein batches are, are really NIC or nuclease or et cetera free. And recently we were kind of plagued by this. Uh, and then you can really visually see uh, that in that, in that context, your DNA molecules in the turf look kind of ragged. And so we, ha we just haven't been able to acquire that. Okay, we now finally, we, we did solve it recently, but we haven't acquired the statistics yet to really do a, an accurate comparison. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, here. Uh, yeah. Within one population, the diffusion coefficient varies by two orders of yeah, magnitude. It does, yeah. Yeah. So, do they switch between some binding and diffusive mode, or? Yeah, and we and and we see that right because we I showed like uh, a trace or two right uh, where you saw that and and what we were doing was kind of coarse right in these experiments because we just fit let's say one diffusion constant per trace right so even if a trace I mean the traces are uh, always have some noise right so we we could have tried to say okay this part of the trace is static but that and that part of the trace is right is mobile but it was not always so easy to make the distinctions and we said okay. Right, so that means that just by that, I'm going to obviously broaden my, my distribution. Okay, yeah. thanks. Other question? I, I have one other question yeah. to ask. Um, in the search for the origin of replication, yeah. you see some diffusion yeah. going on, but also in the presence of ATP, you see uh, direct motion, is that correct? Or uh, not in, the in the case of ORC, whether we, ha we have uh, ATP or ATP gamma doesn't S doesn't difference. make any difference. I yeah. see. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But in the case of the CMG, yeah. in the case of the CMG, you see... You see a clear distinction. Movement. Yeah, you see a processive... So uh, yeah. can, can, can you estimate the processivity of the enzyme in that case, given the fact yeah, that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I don't, I usually, or I sometimes, depending on the length of the talk, I include that, so, but it was order 2 kb. Something like that in the, in these experiments. A KB. Uh, two KB, yeah, two one KB. to two KB, mm. yeah. That's very, yeah, very and that's I don't, I, that's not limited by the bleaching time mm -hmm. of the fluorophore, right? Uh -huh. Which could obviously influence things, but probably it's 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 limited by still some nicks on the DNA. Yeah. It makes sense because yeah. so it could be higher, right? But yeah. if you have a nick on the translocating strand, as soon as it encounters it, that's, that's, the that's, yeah, that's sure. it. Yeah, it will touch. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's thank Nikif for a wonderful talk. Thank you.